I think we're waiting just for a couple of more. Rebecca, right? Yeah, LaDawn responded saying that she was going to come, but we also can, since we record it, I don't ever, we don't have to wait that long. They okay. can watch back if they need to. Okay. You want us to get started now then? Works for me. Don't okay. take away any time from Joe. Right. Okay. Let's go. Go ahead, Jeanette. Welcome everyone. Um, I hope everyone's having a good afternoon. And I just wanted to let you all know that um, I'm gonna hand it over to Joe. Before I do that, um, please stay on. There'll be a survey at the end. Um, so Joe, are you ready? I was born ready. Let's do it. <laughs> so let me go ahead and share my screen and we will get into it. Okay, do you see the presentation or the notes? The presentation, you're good. Full view. Hooray! I, I've gotten that right every time somehow. All right, so actually, you know what? I need to do something. Let me just double check something. Sorry, guys. I just wanted to make sure that everything is optimized for video sharing because I've got a few videos. All right, you guys see the screen? Yep. Yay. All right. So welcome, everybody. I'm not going to introduce myself. I, I feel like you've all met me by now. If not, uh, just ask somebody, but somebody who likes me. Don't ask the person that doesn't like me. Uh, but uh, we're just going to launch into this. And um, just like most of the things that we've covered this is designed to be just a general introductory overview. Uh, we've got a broad group of people um, that, that come to these. So these are designed uh, for everybody. Um, we can definitely get more in depth and I'm always open for questions that lead us in that direction. Um, and uh, also when we get to the question areas and we have a few inter interactive uh, sections, please don't be afraid to ask any questions that develop in the meantime. So today we're gonna to talk about health equity. And when we talk about health equity, there is so much to unpack, so much to unpack. But today uh, we're going to look at a few concepts around health equity. Primarily, uh, we wanna look at health inequities because to understand health equity, you have to understand health inequity. Um, we, we want to talk about intersectionality and also social determinants, also known as social drivers of health. And we'll talk about that briefly, about how the language is changing around that. And then we're also going to take a look at poverty and the reason why, and, and I, have a, I have a whole reason to justify why we need to go into poverty. It's something that affects all of us in the state with the various populations that we're working with. Uh, but also in the particular issues that we're working on, they tend to be the most impacted. So that's also an important thing uh, because that is one of those cross-cutting issues that show up in our state. Now, this is going to be a part one of two sessions. And in the next session, which will be a month from now, 
uh, we're going to look, and, and it's going to be built off of what we're talking about today. We're going to look at local health and environmental indicators of health through an equity lens. So all the things that we're discussing today, we're going to look at them through this lens and uh, analyze these for ourselves. So we, we plan to have some, some data for you to analyze. Uh, we're also going to take some time and do some interactive actions around discussing root causes. Of, of why we think certain things may be happening, why there might be certain challenges around health or environmental indicators. Um, and we're gonna set the stage for some homework that y'all will have. Um, so let's just talk about health equity up top. What is it? Why do we even discuss it? Well, it's a basic principle in public health. And, and it's simply just that everybody should have the right to health. Differences um, in the incidence and the prevalence of health conditions and health status between groups are commonly referred to as health disparities. So when we talk about health equity, we're talking about that we believe everybody has the right to be healthy. However, when we talk about health disparities, we talk about how there can be differences between various groups um, in this health. Uh, it's not experienced the same um, uh, with everybody in our society. Most health disparities affect marginalized groups because of socioeconomic status, maybe race or ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, gender, uh, disability status, geographic location, or some combination of these. And we're gonna talk about those specifically. I wanna give you a few examples. So this is something that touches most of the people in this digital room, and I, I particularly wanted to call this out because a lot of times when we talk about health equity and we talk about health uh, equity issues, people don't often think of geographic equity and the issues that come with living in a specific region. In New Mexico, we have uh, a primary population center. And uh, the rest of the state is rural or even uh, a level below that, which is called frontier. And so this is a specific uh, health disparity that I wanna show you that I particularly became interested in about 13 years ago and pretty much devoted my life to being a part of the solution. And this, what you see here is um, a, a chart uh, that compares rural health indicators uh, and urban health indicators. And right away, you can see some disparities. If you look at heart disease, you see the rate in rural communities is much higher than it is in urban communities, and so on and so forth for cancer, unintentional injuries, chronic lower respiratory disease, and as you see, the rest of those. So that's one example of a health disparity around geographic location or the specific population density in that geographic location. Here's one uh, specifically around uh, youth, uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual disparities. And this is, and you can always see my sources. Um, this is all pretty much CDC info. Um, and you see the disparity here between, uh, and we'll just start with being bullied at school, right? 33% of LGB students compared to 16 heterosexual um, or various other options. Um, you can see that with felt sad or hopeless, uh, used illicit drugs, seriously considered suicide. Uh, this is through the YRRS data. May, many of you may be familiar with that as you track issues that go on with youth in your community. And one of the things that if you pull it out, um, whether you're in a various location or you're looking by race or gender, uh, these are one of those issues, these cross-cutting issues where you see health disparities. Another one here is uh, by race and ethnicity. And you can see life expectancy years by race and ethnicity. And uh, these often uh, can, can express a very far apart, as you can see. So if you look down there at the bottom there, and where you see uh, indigenous 
uh, folks in our nation, their life expectancy is very different than uh, Asian in, in our nation um, by quite a bit, quite a bit. And then you see in between um, with black and Hispanic and white and overall, if you were to just look at the overall, it doesn't give you the full picture of the range that uh, people experience because of the various uh, health disparities that they may have. So those are just a few examples. Now, um, we could actually take entire days, there are entire graduate courses just on this. So obviously I'm not going to be able to go through all of these, but just as an example, those are a few. People in such groups not only experience worse health, but also tend to have less access to social determinants or conditions uh, like healthy food, good housing, good education, safe neighborhoods, freedom from racism and other forms of discrimination that support health. And so when we talk about health disparities, it's important to understand social determinants or social drivers, which I'll get into the driver part. Uh, but first, let's watch this video. Can you all hear it? I can't see anybody. Can somebody- uh, Yes, we can hear it. Yay, all right, here we go. There's one view of us as biological creatures that we are determined by our genes that what we see in our biology is somehow innately us because of who we were born to be. What that misses is that we grow up and develop. We grow up as children, we grow up as adults and continue. We interact constantly with the world in which we are engaged. That's the way in which our biology actually happens. We carry our history in our bodies. How else could, how could we not? Living in America should be a ticket to good health. We have the highest gross national product in the world. I'm very happy to finally have some of my cars in one location, some of them. We spend $2 trillion per year on medical care. That's nearly half of all the health dollars spent in the world. But we've seen our statistics. We live shorter, often sicker lives than in any other industrialized country. We rank 30th in life expectancy. Especially of economically developed countries, we are at the bottom of the list. A higher percentage of our babies die in their first year of life than in Malta, Slovenia, Cyprus. How can this be? Is this just because 47 million of us have no health insurance? Healthcare can deal with the uh, diseases and illnesses, but a lack of healthcare is not the um, cause of illness and disease. It is like saying, since um, aspirin cures uh, a fever, that uh, lack of aspirin must be the cause of the fever. Or is it mostly because of our American diet and personal health behaviors? Those behaviors themselves, in part, determined by economic status. And so uh, our ability to avoid smoking and eat a healthy diet depends, in turn, uh, on our access to income, education, and what we call the social determinants of health. But wouldn't our genes trump social determinants of health? Among twins who live together until age 18, 
who basically grew up in the same households, so had at least a relatively similar exposure. If they diverged later in life, if one became professional and the other was working class, they ended up with different health status as adults. This is among identical twins. Written into our bodies is a lifetime of experience, shaped by social conditions and policies that can determine who will be sicker, who will die sooner. There are ways in which our society is organized that are bad for our health. Uh, and there's no doubt that we could reconfigure ourselves in ways that would benefit our health. There are huge inequalities in the society. All this wealth is maldistributed. Pet food, ice for the pet's water. And I think that's in part why the US as a whole has relatively poor health amongst the rich countries and why even the better of people are suffering. And we think that that is not inevitable. All right, so I like to let uh, people that are way more qualified than me uh, speak about such things. And I think that uh, does a great job. Now that comes from um, a show called Unnatural Causes, which is a PBS documentary. If you just do some basic searching around in the internet, you can find it generally, and you can watch the whole series, actually. Uh, I don't know how legal that is, but that's a thing. So uh, I, I recommend checking that out. Uh, it gives a lot of context. Now, before I go any deeper into discussing the social determinants of health, I also want to talk about some of the language change. Now, in our last, um, our last uh, experience we had together, we talked about how sometimes language changes around specific concepts or words because it adjusts to our society. And, and this happens to be one of those things where the language is changing. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear people describe these very things as social drivers of health. Um, and this is happening in real time. If you were to go and look at most of the stuff on the CDC's website, you're going to see social determinants of health. However, uh, some uh, some departments of health, for instance, across the nation have formally adopted the word social drivers of health, and some uh, prominent public health organizations have done so as well. Uh, a, a basic reason why that is happening is a determined is something that has been determined. It's something that is happening or has, hap has happened to someone, and it's said in almost a way uh, that it couldn't change. Um, and, and then also there's a question of, well, who determined this? Uh, did the person determine this for themselves or did somebody else determine it for them? Um, however, drivers of health uh, is a better word for the reason of a driver can change, um, a driver can be situational, uh, a, a driver is something that everyone observes. So that's my understanding of it at least. Uh, but like I said, these, Changes are happening in real time. Um, before I move on from that, even and get a little deeper into it, does anybody have anything they'd like to add about that language change as they're experiencing it? Hey, Joseph, this is Gerilyn. Go for it. Um, I was just gonna know, I was thinking about this. Um thinking about the way that tribe tribes, pueblos, and nations also have indigenous social determinants of health too as well. Mm -hmm. And so that adds another layer <laughs> of language as you had noted. So just wanted to put that out there too. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you for that. Thank you for that. So when we think of these concepts, it, it's important to understand that these are concepts, these are public health concepts but at the end of the day, when we talk about public health, we can't forget about the public. And that's why sometimes things like this happen, right? We have to acknowledge uh, the full breadth of something and we have to acknowledge when culture changes around it. So let's actually talk about what these determinants of health, and I, I'm calling them that um, because that's what all of the information out there says. Uh, but uh, please also think of them as drivers of health or whatever works best for you. Um, when we look at economic stability, 
that encompasses a lot of things like employment, income, expenses, debt, medical bills, support. What would be something else that could be economic stability that isn't on this list? And for some reason, I can't see my chat, but I'm gonna ask you to either put it in the chat or unmute and say it out loud. And I'll try to figure out why I can't see my chat. Hi, this is Janice Herrera. Uh, apologies, I joined a little late today. Uh, it's been a wild day on my end, but uh, yeah, one uh, economic stability metric that might be a good one would be um, labor force participation. Mm, yeah. uh, or perhaps um, wage inequality, yes. um, unemployment. Oh, I see there's employment listed. Uh, I, I'm stealing topics right now from a tool that I just learned about yesterday, um, which is the Johns Hopkins University, uh, I think it's called GovX site, where you can look at different metrics for a city and they kind of give you like a grading for different topics. Uh -huh. and then uh, compare with other cities. So I'll just drop that into the uh, chat in case it's helpful for anyone. Thank you so much for that. And yes, thank you for those additions. We're good. All right, let's talk about neighborhood and physical environment. So there are things like housing, transportation, safety, parks, playgrounds, walkability, which that one's very fascinating. I've been involved with various programs uh, around that just simply because People that have access to better sidewalks have less heart disease. Communities, we've seen this in communities. Uh, zip code geography, we talked about that when we were comparing rural to urban. What are some other neighborhood or physical environment issues? There's a glaring one that we're all working on that's not on here. I have, what about terrain? Talk more about that, absolutely. So, there's research that shows that those individuals who live where it's greener and there's water, they're more they're less likely to encompass or experience health issues, mm. mental in, you know their mental instabilities um, more stable if you're in a greener area or if you have running you know um, a stream nearby. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, all the Southern New Mexicans just kind of flinched right now. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> Thank you for that. Is there anything else anybody would include on this list? I would say like the weather. I don't know if that's part of ge geography, but um, like it's so hot where we're at in the summertime, mm -hmm. even in the evening. Yep. And then like right this time of year, it's so cold. So you yep. kind of... There's a limited few months of the year that it's nice. Absolutely. So like when we think about some of the things that we're preparing for, like climate change in, in some of the areas that we're in, this, this becomes a very serious issue, right? Education. So there's literacy, language, early childhood education, vocational cha uh, training, higher education. Is there something else that you might want to include on this? or maybe even expound upon. So this is Annie. I'm not sure if it would fall in here, but like even if people have had like bad experiences with um, like even if with the health systems where they don't trust it or they don't want to, like they maybe they, a family member had a bad experience and then they, they don't want to go and seek health, you know, any kind of, health opportunity they don't want to seek um medical help because of bad experiences or maybe yeah, like absolutely. and they could fall into education because they're uneducated that not every like every doctor is going to be the same absolutely absolutely thank you for that and um you know I, i've actually just recently did some research on the school to prison pipeline and um how unintentionally educational systems sometimes intentionally, but unintentionally, most education uh, systems might be set up in a way that can harm what we used to call at-risk uh, youth. Um, so yeah, that's a great example, thank you. Um, food, so there's hunger, access to healthy options, 
some of us that live in the more rural communities, what are other things that affect food that maybe most people don't often think of because they get their food from the store <laughs> rather than uh, maybe uh, more direct ways? What are some uh, issues that we need to be concerned about around food? So I'd like to add, so just really quickly going back to education, um, um, having English as a second language or having two languages puts mm -hmm. another individual, at, I feel like at an advantage. So it helps. Absolutely. Them. So I feel that's part of education, but also trans, I feel like it also um, translates to food. So having more culture, um, a culturally grounded or traditional way of life for native people, I'm sure for the Hispanic groups too, that they have um, better, di you know, a better diet quality or um, more information on where, what kind of foods, traditional cultural foods they have. So that the, I, I would say possibly those are some, some things to consider culture and um, history. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, very good. I think are in our area, we have, like we have even a, another coordinator in our health council that the closest gallon of milk is like 45 miles away from her house. Yeah. So very remote, rural, having to drive long distances. And then here in you know, Tucum Carry, there's even people like I noticed that go every day to like the dollar store or the grocery store to get food um, because they have to carry it home. They don't have vehicles. Yeah. And so they're only going to buy what they can carry and maybe not healthy, the healthiest option. Yes, yes, absolutely. And and that was one of the issues too. Um, sometimes it's just hard for people even to get to their food, whether they have access to healthy options or not, any food it's hard for them to get to. Very good. Any other issues? All right, let's move on to community and social context. Now, um, I, I'm going to throw this out here. Um, our Surgeon General, I think I mentioned this before, but this is an important development in what we're understanding from a public health concept um, or, or, or lens, I should say. Uh, our Surgeon General has really been um, very active in promoting the message around loneliness as a public health issue. In fact, there are multiple countries that have had very strategic approaches to this and have even appointed ministers or administrators or, or, or key people in charge of addressing loneliness in their country. And so I would add this on the list um, before I even ask others, because I'm sure there are other things that you, you all can add as well. But loneliness is a huge issue and it's become more of an issue and very rapidly um, for people in all age groups, uh, various um, social strata as well as gender, we're seeing this as a cross-cutting issue. Uh, so directly connected to that is social integration, support systems, community engagement, discrimination, stress. What are some other things that we would add on this list, community and social context? What's something we've been observing in the media quite a bit uh, that we find out is happening in our communities quite often? So just on the chat, um, Anthony said social media following and politics like Congress's behavior as representatives of people. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm not sure if it fits in this topic. I'm thinking it kind of straddles like support systems and community engagement. But uh, I was thinking about uh, internet or broadband access uh, because there's so many uh, community and socially based programs nowadays that uh, if you don't have a computer, you know, you may not be able to access uh, different services. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I would even connect that to economic stability and education and healthcare systems. 
uh, because many of those are connected to our ability to access broadband. I think many of us that live in rural communities experienced this during the pandemic when uh, mo uh, many of our kids had to go to school online and the schools themselves didn't even have reliable internet. Or uh, if you needed to meet with a, uh, a, a, a healthcare provider and uh, they might not have even had the best internet because of wh where their location is, that's a very alarming thing. And that, that affects um, our state disproportionately uh, uh, for uh, in comparison to a lot of other states. So yeah, that's very good. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else that we put in this community and social context uh, when we're looking at social determinants or social drivers of health? All right, let's look at the healthcare system. What else might we add? Actually, let me go back. I wanted to mention um, community violence um, in community and social context. I think that, uh, I think, well, it's not a think. It, it, affects, it affects how we live and operate and think as a society. Um, I had an interesting conversation with my 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 daughter's uh, boyfriend, uh, they, they both go to UNM and he happened to be in the mall when there was a shooting. They both came down for Thanksgiving and the day before there was a shooting at the mall. And uh, we had this interesting conversation and he made the statement that was really chilling to me. And uh, it really stopped me in my tracks. He said, do you ever get the sense that we're all just waiting our turn? And this is a 20 year old young man. and the the incidences around him have shaped his mind to think this way and i couldn't disagree with him and that's terrifying but that is a social determinant of health as well whether you live in a war-torn country or a country that's not war-torn but uh maybe it has uh violence that nobody sees coming often Healthcare system so there's health coverage provider availability Provider linguistic and cultural competency, which uh, has come up in, in other areas. Quality of care. There's some other things that we've mentioned uh, for other issues that I think apply to healthcare system. What might those be? Or what might be some additional so social determinants that you see around healthcare system? Uh, I'm going to throw one out that I've been uh, kind of studying a bit uh, through my work, uh, which is, you know, related to provider availability, also pharmacy availability. Mm. Uh, I've been doing yeah. some mapping work later in, lately in Albuquerque around some um, pharmacy desert situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's a thing. What about transportation? A lot of times, especially people in um, in less populated areas, they may have to go very far to meet with a healthcare provider, especially if it's a specialist, right? And so that geographic isolation comes into play in a lot of different areas. Um, when we look at social determinants of health, and it's often left off of these larger lists, but I feel like in a state such as New Mexico, that is that is... That's definitely higher on the list for us. So that's pretty much uh, as deep as we can go into social determinants of health today. But I, I hope that you get a clear idea. Um, when we look at the health outcomes that are affected by the social determinants of health, they're listed here. Mortality, morbid morbidity, uh, life expectancy, health care expenditures, health status. Uh, functional limitations, all of these things can be impacted by all of these various social drivers of health. So after we look at social determinants of health, it's important to also understand health disparities because this is what's, as you look at these social determinants of health, that's what can be revealed. Health disparities that are also referred to as health inequities. 
Now, here is a graphic. Uh, maybe you're used to seeing the one where three people are looking at a, I believe it's a baseball game, and uh, one can't see over the fence, one can barely see over the fence, and one can see very fine over the fence because they're taller. Uh, and then, the, and that's described as equity because the fence is at the same level no matter what. And then there's equity where maybe the shortest person is standing on uh, a platform to help them see and everybody able to see over this fence. I prefer this graphic more because that just kind of points out the difference in in people. However, it's deeper than that because sometimes it's not just the people that have experienced differences, but it's their context. And so I visualize these bicycles as their context. Uh, it, it, it's not that there's something wrong with the person or there's a deficiency wrong with the person. It's that the right context is not surrounding them in some cases. And sometimes uh, sometimes it's a, it's a struggle with the person. Sometimes it's a struggle with the context. Sometimes it's a combination of both. Either way, when we look at equity, that is a case where the context matches the person. A taller person needs a taller bike. Someone that might not have use of their legs might need a, a different type of bike. A medium person needs a medium bike, at least that's how I'm interpreting it, and a smaller person might need a small bike. But everybody's moving forward. That's a beautiful thing. I love this graphic. But anyways, health inequities are when the result of a systematic and unjust distribution of critical conditions happen. Uh, health equity then is understood in public health literature and practice is when everyone has the opportunity to attain full health potential, and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential. Or like I like to see it in this uh, graphic here, everybody gets to move forward. Everybody gets the right bike for them and everybody gets to move forward. Now, when we talk about that, it's also important to talk about intersectionality because a lot of times when these conversations take place, uh, people are just kind of sectioned off into this group or that group, and people don't take into account how maybe people might be a part of multiple groups, thereby experiencing multiple experiences simultaneously. So let's talk about intersectionality. Intersectionality is a way of understanding and analyzing complexity in the world, in people, and in human experience. The events and conditions of social political life in the self can seldom be understood as shaped by one factor. They are shaped by many factors in diverse and mutually influencing ways. And when it comes to social inequality, people's lives and organizations of power in a given society are better understood as being shaped not by a single axis of social division, be it race or gender or class, but as many axes uh, that work together and influence each other. Intersectionality as an analytical tool gives people better access to the complexity of the world and of themselves. People use intersectionality as an analytical tool to solve problems that they or others around them face. So I, I wanna take a look at this graphic for a, a, a sec and hopefully because I'm notorious for busy slides because I try to put too much information on them, but I hope you can see the, the graphic well enough. And um, in the very center, you see a health condition, but then you, you see all of the various things that can impact that health condition. So when we're looking at intersectionality and health, uh, it's important to understand that all of these things have an impact, right? And this also kind of connects to the concept of social drivers of health, right? Uh, you have things such as gender, religion, disability, sexuality, age, comorbidities, poverty, right? And then in this text around it, it says intersectional experience of health-related stigma and adversities related to different inequities or identities. I'll give you an example. 
And, and, and this is one that I've spent a lot of time. I, I spent uh, three years uh, directing a recovery community, right? And uh, the way that our society interacts with people that struggle with substance misuse or substance use disorder uh, can be quite, uh, quite uh, uninspiring at times, right? And so there are stigmas related to dealing with that particular thing. Uh, if you're of a particular sexual orientation or political affiliation, depending on where you are, um, or maybe religion, for instance, all of those things could have high stigma around them um, if, it is, if it doesn't look like the community that's around you. So that's an important thing to understand when looking at um, our health and intersectionality. But then there's also that, that social layer. There's not just how you identify, but there's how others identify you, right? So there's the intrapersonal level, there's the interpersonal level, and then there's a structural level. There's society as a whole. Then there are the communities within that society. And then there are close-knit societies or even how you view yourself. So those are all important con uh, contexts when looking at intersectionality. And that's why intersectionality, though it's a very simple concept, it can be a very complicated thing, a very complicated lens to look through because there's so many things to consider. And so to help you with that, I wanna throw out this exercise and um, I wanna talk about the various isms, right? Now here before you, there is a list of various types of oppression and the characteristics uh, that uh, tend to follow those. Uh, uh, those types of oppression. And what I would like to ask you to do in the chat is to first count up how many isms are you touched by and just put that number in there. It could be one or it could be all of them, who knows, right? But just take a little time, think through it, look through the list. I'll talk through the list. Uh, then I'm gonna ask you in a separate prompt, we, want, we aren't there yet, uh, I'm going to ask somebody to unmute and maybe talk about how they may impact each other. For instance, if I'm struggling with ageism in military as, or militarism, how is that impacting each other? How do those play off against each other? Um, I'll also invite somebody to maybe uh, write something in the chat if they're so moved as well. And then I'll also uh, ask the flip side of that. How do your isms privilege you? In other words, when you look at this chart, you see the privileged and favor, uh, favored groups. So I'll, I'll use myself first as an example because I'm not gonna ask you to do something I'm not willing to do, right? Um, so when I look at this, my unfavored score, as I call it, is a three. There are three isms that I'm affected by. Um, when I look at, and I'm skipping down to the yellow question or the last question, when I look at the privileged side, there's eight. There are a lot of things. Um, as a, a straight, cisgendered, Protestant male of a certain age, uh, there are certain things that work in my favor. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to do that. And we're going to look at the first question. And I'll first ask you this. How many isms are you touched by? Go ahead and add that into the chat. Can everybody see this chart OK? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, we got a two in there, thank you, five. Two, all right. Anyone else? I've only got, okay, here we go. Let's see, two, five, a four. Another two. All right, a couple more minutes.
All right, I'll move on to the next question. When we, when we look at how they impact one another, what are some examples? And it doesn't necessarily have to be from your personal life. It could be something you've observed. But what are some examples, and, and this is tying it together to intersectionality, right? Of how these could impact each other. Would somebody be willing to unmute and maybe uh, share an example or maybe somebody write something in the chat? So you're asking if like to give an example of how like this these impact us personally? It could be you personally or something you've observed, right? Um, um, and what I'm really looking for like, is uh, intersectionality, right? Like how how do these things play off of each other? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I used to teach ag. And so when I first started teaching ag, there was not a lot of women ag teachers. Mm. And so I, not only was I very young, fresh out of college, but I was a young woman. And mm -hmm. most of the men, the teachers in New Mexico were older men, like over mm -hmm. the age of 50. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we were also all very rural, you know, very rural areas. And yep. so it took a little bit, I feel, to be kind of accepted. It was almost like I had to prove, um, like prove that I could hang with them and teach ag and welding and all those things. But I feel like it's not as bad anymore because there are probably just as many women now teaching as there were men or you know teaching as men now as compared to when I started teaching hmm. that is a perfect example and not only is that a good example I'm also happy to hear that that's changing <laughs> and that there's uh, more representation because agriculture affects all of us right and so we need we need everybody's voice and everybody's view and experience in agriculture so yeah awesome thank you for sharing that with us is there anybody else that uh, would want to share an example? Um, I could share an example that I lifted from the uh, Health Equity Summit uh, mm -hmm. this week, which was that uh, the presenter, Sunny Gonzalez, uh, shared the story of Elijah McLean, who mm -hmm. um, was a young Black man, uh, who had a disability and encountered uh, extreme and fatal uh, law enforcement violence. And mm. so that was something that we talked about is how, uh, because of ableism and the intersection with racism, uh, mm. uh, if you're a person of color in the United States with a disability, uh, you know, your, your chances of violence uh, and incarceration uh, are much higher compared to, you know, either of those two groups individually, uh, mm -hmm. you know, looking at the, the mainstream population. Yes, yes, thank you for that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Great example. An another one I had, like I said, I just did uh, some recent research on the prison to school pipeline and one of the most vulnerable intersections is uh, people of color that also have a, a, um, a learning disability they tend to find themselves in more uh, trouble at school, which can uh, become criminally justice involved. Um, and, and so we see intersectionality play out in a lot of places. I think one, and, and I, I bring this up a lot because I've worked with this issue specifically, but it also impacts half of the people in our state, anti-ruralism. And sometimes that shows up systemically in that uh, people will just, Kind of overlook the needs of people in rural communities because they're like, well, who's out there anyways? Nobody's really out there. Um, some some of the some of the things that some of the, the horrendous things I've heard from some of my indigenous brothers and sisters when they talk about how the bombs were tested out um, in our state, and people would just say, oh, well, nobody's out there. Meanwhile, there's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people out there, right? So sometimes sometimes uh, oppression can be just seeming invisible. And so um, 
those are examples of intersectionality. Now, I want to take this in a different direction. And let me do a quick review before I do this, because I want to make sure that um, we're connecting all the dots here. So we started out with, sorry if I made you dizzy. We started out with the, the, the concept of health equity broadly. And the idea of health equity is that everybody deserves to be healthy, right? But in discovering uh, that everybody's not healthy, uh, we, we understand health disparities, right? That there are differences in how people experience health. We realize that these health disparities can show up because of various social determinants or social drivers of health. Uh, some people, sometimes people have control of these things. Sometimes it's something that's going on in their environment or something happening to them, whether locally or systemically that affects them. And we explored all the various different de social determinants of health. And we talked about how these uh, social determinants of health are health disparities that happen because of health inequity, right? We also talked about all the various isms that one may encounter because of inter intersectionality and how that can affect your health as well. From every level, all the way from the, 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 the structural or macro level um, in our grand society, all the way down to more personal levels in the micro level. So we put all that together and then I just wanna launch into poverty directly. Why? specifically because of the issue we're dealing with. Now, this is true for a lot of other issues, but this is very true when it comes to uh, uh, many of the environmental issues that you all are working on. I lifted this from a, a, a great journal article, and you, see, you can always see all my sources on all the slides. I recommend that you Google this and, and read up on it because it's very pertinent to all of us. Specifically, it's written about the, the Southwest climate gap. So that includes um, Arizona, Texas, and uh, New Mexico. And um, just the specific challenges that are found in this specific region around climate change and uh, the, the specific things that we need to prepare for and deal with currently. Um, and so I want to read this quote from it. Uh, there are disproportionate and unequal implications of climate change and climate change mitigation for people of color and the poor. And so I want to talk about that specifically because another thing we understand about our state is that we are one of the poorest states in the nation and that two thirds of our kids are in poverty or in go hungry in many cases. Um, and this is this is a cross-cutting issue as well across our state, and it's it 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 would it I feel it would be incomplete to talk about all of these things without talking about poverty because we we see it in every segment of our population, whether it's rural or urban. Uh, when we look at race or ethnicity or gender, we see it everywhere. So. I want to introduce you to the work of um, Dr. Ruby Payne, and maybe you've heard of her. Uh, uh, she has this popular, very popular amongst people in the social service industry. Uh, her book is called Understanding Poverty. Uh, has anybody ever been exposed to any coursework around understanding poverty or read the book or anything? Anybody? I have. Okay. It's really good stuff. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So We've actually, I've actually done two trainings with one of her trainers. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Good. You, you can throw in all the things I'm leaving out on this then. <laughs> First, I want to look at social class and poverty just in general and how we define it. Now, here's the thing. What I'm showing you, and this is one of the, there are multiple academic models around social class or, and or poverty. Uh, this is one of them. This is one of the more prominent ones. And uh, for some reason, I don't know why, there aren't a lot of updated models on this. And so you have to do your own math to, to do the inflation. The inflation from 2005, which is when this model comes out and when a lot of the models came out in between uh, the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, it's, it's, it's gone up about 40%. So everything that you're looking at right now, just increase that by 40%. 
And um, just so that we can have a, a, a working definition or understanding of the various social classes. So you have upper middle class, white collar, salary management and professional employees, advanced college degree, household income above uh, 100,000 uh, times uh, 0.4. Uh, I think that's how you do the math, yes. Uh, but maybe considered uh, less for one in uh, one income earner households or some lesser paid professionals, active in politics and social issues. So that's about 15% uh, according to this estimation. Then you have lower middle class, uh, which is uh, usually they have a bachelor's degree, white collar employee with considerable less autonomy than upper middle class professionals. Incomes commonly between 70, uh, or excuse me, 30,000 and 75,000 uh, with the 40% inflation for today. Uh, depending on number income earners emulate uh, consumption patterns of the most in affluent, <laughs> overworked, little leisure. I have a lot to say about that, but let me move on. Uh, then you have working class, blue collar and clerical workers, often uh, in uncomfortable environments, dangerous environments. Uh, when we think of a lot of our larger industries in New Mexico, they're extractive industries like mining, uh, oil and gas, agriculture. Uh, these are uncomfortable and sometimes unsafe environments, right? Little job security, uh, prone to outsourcing, which has become uh, more and more of an issue. Um, it's a bigger issue now than it was in 2005. Uh, closely supervised household income is commonly between 16 and 30. Uh, they pride themselves in doing real work. I'm not going to disagree with that. If they stop doing what they're doing, nobody nobody eats. Um, and then there's lower class, uh, prone to job loss, often work multiple jobs, usually in the service industry. Household income often less than 16,000, uh, but adjust for inflation 40%. So uh, that's one of the academic models. Now I want to I want to let uh, Ms. Payne say what we're going to talk about next. Well, hidden rules are by environment. Class, just like race, is experienced first at a very personal level, and it shapes your thinking. For example, we have huge hidden rules around food. In poverty, it's about quantity. And after a meal, people will say, are you full? Did you have enough? Middle class, it's about quality. Did you like it? Was it good? In wealth, it's about presentation. Was it artistically presented? Did it have aesthetic appeal? But what probably puts most people in orbit is the hidden rules we have around money and time. Middle class, wealth, and poverty around the world tend to think about their time somewhat the same in this way. Middle class sees their time and money related to education or achievement, work, and Things, possessions, things. Middle class around the world, they go to work during the day, they go to school at night to get better classes, and they buy things, okay? And middle class has two rules about money. I don't ask you for money, and you don't ask me. And if you borrow, you got to pay it back. But in wealth, the rules are different. In wealth, your decision-making is made around three things your financial, your political, and your social connections for two reasons. Number one, they keep you safe. And number two, they help you make more money. There's such reverse snobbery in middle class about wealth because middle class does not understand what a huge issue personal safety is in wealth. You see, when you have a 15,000 square foot home, you cannot take care of it by yourself. Furthermore, you have to have people help you. That makes you vulnerable. I think a fabulous example in the United States right now is all the Madoff victims. They entrusted their money to him. They didn't know how to take care of it himself. Personal safety is huge, so your connections. See, in middle class, if somebody wants to know whether you're worthy of respect, they ask you what you do. But in wealth, they want to know who you know, okay? And where, they find that out by asking where you went to undergraduate school, where you went to... Um, 
where you've traveled, immediately it allows them to know what your connection base is. And one of the hidden rules in wealth is when you go to a party among the very wealthy, you do not introduce yourself. You are introduced. But if you go to a party among the middle class and you don't introduce yourself, then people say you're rude. Different environments, different rules. And it has to do with whether or not you can develop relationships. Well, the rule about money and wealth is you just don't talk about the cost of an individual item. A lot of times those items are one of a kind. You couldn't have it anyway. But if you were in poverty, in generational poverty, two generations or more, you have a different problem again. Your problem is that you simply don't have that much material security. Oh, you have a few things but you don't have material security. And you spend your time in survival. Relationships help you stay alive. And entertainment takes away the pain. Well, hidden rules then negotiate environments for you. And if you don't know them, then people exclude you from the relationship. And then your ability to get new ideas is significantly reduced. All right, now, I think it's really important to introduce this concept into the conversation for multiple reasons. And, but specifically to you all, political spaces, agencies, public health initiatives, and the media operate for middle class and or upper middle class norms. And they use the hidden rules of the middle class, which may alienate the most vulnerably and impacted people by the issue, right? And so this is another area that I think is important for discussion as we're preparing ourselves. Um, oh, and by the way, thank you for in the chat who did the math. I appreciate that. Um, so please look at the chat for the math on those levels in 2023. Um, so it's really important uh, when we talk about this issue that We'll dis the di the issues that we're working on that will disproportionately um, impact people that find themselves uh, more vulnerable um, because of poverty. But we're working with systems that operate on a different set of rules. And maybe you even encounter that in your health councils when you're trying to work on a specific issue in the greater population, uh, but you find that the rules that you engage by, even in your health council, are different than the rules that happen on the street, so to speak. So I wanna ask this question and, and uh, maybe we can discuss briefly about it um, as we're getting close to the end of our time. What hidden rules well, you need to navigate while working on this issue with various partners, whether it's with various agencies or political spaces or the community. And it works both ways because you might find yourself in a situation, maybe you were raised in a middle class environment and maybe you're not working amongst the middle class. Maybe you're working on a class above you or, or a class, I don't want to say the word below you, but a different class. Um, how do you navigate these hidden rules? Have you thought through the hidden rules? Uh, so I wanna put this chart up and these are some of the things that um, Ruby mentioned, right? When you think of the work ahead of you, um, as we're embarking on this journey together, what are some of the things that you think may come up that you need to think through and maybe even discuss with your health counselors? I can't see anybody. So did the question even make sense? Yes, it makes sense. I feel like it's a lot to take in. A lot of things that um that are I would it was obvious, but I don't I didn't know about Ruby Payne. So I'm still taking it in like, okay. So trying to figure out, okay, where where could I work? Because I work in tribal public health and mm -hmm. I see that a lot of the communities that I've worked in fit into a specific class and we're trying to work with another class. Mm -hmm. That becomes a challenge. And so trying to figure out, okay, 
where, you know, where to apply this question you have. Yeah. And and I I'm 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 glad that the silence is because it, it's a lot to think of and and I hope you can see the direct connection to health equity and a lot of times a lot of times the systems that are designed to solve a particular problem or work on a particular issue work by a, a whole completely different set of rules and because of that uh, they find themselves inefficient or ineffective even. Um, not to say that that's what your all's experience is, but just acknowledging that as part of an issue that, that, that happens when we look at health inequities, right? It's not that there are people that show up to work every day with evil in their hearts, wanting to, to mistreat people. I'm not saying that's not a thing either. I am saying though, that most people that get aligned with this type of work is because they want to see something beautiful and necessary happen in the world. But there are reasons, there are things that get in the way that make it difficult. And so this is one of those important conversations when we look at everything through a health equity lens uh, to acknowledge what, what are the, the hidden social rules that sometimes may impact our best desires to, to helping people. Or, and it might not be our personal hidden rules. It might be the, the hidden rules of the organization, agency, or group that you're working with, or your community, or your society. Um, nobody chooses where they're born. It's not about blaming. It's just like the, the isms exercise. Uh, the, one of the reasons why I think it's important that we do the isms exercise is that uh, to realize you know, we all generally are dealing with some type of oppression. Are there some worse than others? Absolutely. But it's still important to understand what we have in common as well. I think one thing that we could take into account when we're looking at these differences or the hidden roles is when we're trying to either educate or get people to want to get involved with climate change. I think this is important to think about maybe what the driving factors mm -hmm. are for different people in the community of why they care about it, right? It might, for social benefit or environmental benefit might not be enough for people. It might need to be that it's their health, right? So Absolutely. I think it's important to think about that too. Absolutely. Um, and thank you for that. I, I, I think it's, personally, I find it very difficult to talk about what may happen in the next 20 years to somebody that's worried about right now, because mm -hmm. they need to be worried about right now. And yeah. So, and the other thing is money, right? Like a lot yeah. of, of like prevention or treatment of, of climate change impacts cost a lot of money and they're not easily accessible. So yep. it's also something to think about. Yep. Yep. Try, try to tell somebody with an unreliable car that they need to drive an electric car, right? Mm -hmm. That's... <laughs> Or tell yeah. someone they have to buy a hundred, a couple hundred dollar air filter just just because yeah. there's a wildfire, right? It's like, and they're just trying to get to work. Mm -hmm. So I, again, I, I hope you see, I, and I I feel like some of you have definitely caught the connection here. Why I think this is a this is often a missing thing when people talk about health equity. Um, you have to think of where people are in their environments when you're thinking through messaging or when you're thinking of how you're uh, in, in impacting people, um, when you deal with uh, partners or collaborators or whatever word we wanna use, uh, one of the things I talked about that you have to think about is the wife or the what's in it for me. What, what is the thing that, um, what, what, what most impacts them? And so this is along the lines of that in that you have to understand the dynamics that shape their lives in that moment and understand that the way you experience it might be different than the way they experience it. And that goes both ways, whether you're talking uh, to somebody that has wealth or somebody that's in poverty. If you're talking to a politician, the things that you deeply, deeply care about, they might not care about because they're, they care about other things for different reasons. And so that goes both ways. And that's why, again, it's very important to, to have this concept, especially when we look at, and I see your hand, Janice, um, um, 
especially when, when, when we come back to this and we look at some of our health indicator data and environmental indicator data, and we look at some of the unique challenges that you may have in your community and maybe what some of the root causes may be, it's important to, uh, to really think through how you even would talk about it to various groups. Janice. Yeah, one that I've been thinking about lately uh, that I think this applies to, but I don't see on the list is um, sort of like channels of communication. Uh, you know, and that could vary depending on different disaggregated demographics, not only socioeconomic status, but looking at socioeconomic status and the hidden rules for this. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience, for people who are experiencing poverty, communication channels are oftentimes um, word of mouth. Mm, yeah. um, and then middle class, it might be more likely to be things like media stations, like the radio or the news mm -hmm. or um, you know other things like that, the internet. And then I find that people who are very wealthy uh, might be getting their information from um, so-called uh, insiders or experts. Yeah. Like they can just go to a government agent and ask them directly Absolutely. or uh, they may have a lawyer they could consult with or things like that very good very good yeah i would i would not only would i would agree i i would also add in the same exact vein you know not only how they communicate or or or, or get their information but even what they would trust right because people have different proximity to different things it might be harder for somebody to trust a professor, for instance, than somebody who actually knows a professor, right? If you've never even awesome. been in the environment where you can hang out with a professor, you might have a different level of comfortability with approaching somebody or even hearing what they have to say. And that's this is awesome. what they're shaped by. Oh, I, I hear somebody, yes? Go ahead, Anthony. Oh, maybe he wasn't talking to us. I'll go ahead and uh, stop sharing. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll have a few. I, I'll actually have one more slide. But it pretty much just says questions. So I'll stop sharing. And um, let's Can you hear me now? Yeah. Now we can hear you, Anthony. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I like the conversation and from the lady that spoke earlier about communications. The reason why I put in the chat on um, social media is because, yes, everybody's health is being affected by what they're seeing on social me media. Let it be TikTok, YouTube, or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, if you look at the news these days, we are impacted because Depending on which side of the political spectrum you are on, you could be listening to Fox News or Newsmax or maybe ABC News or CBS. Mm -hmm. They have both different propaganda, one's, one more so than the other, and pretty much have an allegiance, allegiance to the powerfulness of the almighty dollar in terms of who is in political power at this time. So I think that that affects our own perception of how safe we are as a country, as a community. One of the things I wanted to also bring up is the fact that a lot of the uh, state politics, if we go up there as health councils and talk about prevention and intervention, and yet you have 20 lawyers coming in representing big oil, big gas, big insurance, big pharma, big business, big everything, they are coming in there with an attitude and you can see all the blue coats and what type of clothing they're wearing by having them having an impact on our legislatures. <clears throat> so I think that there is a big political divide that is taking place, but there is a racial divide that is currently in existence. Yet we don't want to really bring it out in a way because uh, look at the abortion laws, look at the Supreme Court, look at the ethics that are going on with our congressmen. Look at how the one side of the House is voting and regarding impeachment and a lot of health issues. And I think that that's where a lot of us that are looking at 
the community-based programs in working with the people that are actually being impacted by Medicare, private insurance, and um, Medicare, we see the differences of what law, policy, and the impacts of these individuals. So I think these are things that we need to consider. Now, we talk about climate change. Yes, climate change is going to be an impact. But guess what? <clears throat> you have big oil, <laughs> big uh, gas, big, uh, um, I guess, um, automobile companies that are against anything like that because what we see is the objective is profits over a better world and better people. Think about it. And thank you for that. Thank you for that, Anthony. Um, oh, and I see in the chat here, I cannot imagine being a youth who has lived their entire life with the presence of social media. It's a huge impact on mental health. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely been a lot of study around uh, that as well. Um, there are a lot of challenges, <laughs> a lot of challenges. Um, I, I grew up, and maybe this is toxic positivity, but I, I always grew up with the phrase, there's no problems, just opportunities. And we have a whole lot of opportunities. Um, so. This is good. I'm glad that you guys are all thinking through a health equity lens. This is good practice because when we come back next month, uh, we're going to we're going to look at community data, and uh, we don't exactly have it all figured out yet. But uh, we're going to somehow simultaneously look at our communities uh, that are represented here, and um, and and just talk about when we look at it through a health equity lens. What are we seeing? And then also uh, leave room for discussion over what do we think some of the root causes are? Why is that important? Well, when you're working on an issue, it, it, you could work on the symptoms or you could work on what's actually causing it, right? So um, just having some conversation around that and thinking about how you can use that to strategically impact how you move forward in your communities with uh, your partners. Um, and so we will do that together. And that's going to be a lot more interactive, which I'm, I'm grateful for, because who wants to just hear me talk all the time? That's annoying even to me. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to hearing your voices as we kind of explore uh, how we get to deal with all these opportunities. Opportunity, yes. Everybody wants opportunity, right? Okay. Anyways, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you. Uh, I always appreciate this. Um, in the chat, there is a survey, be nice, but be honest. Um, and, uh, I will pass it off to whoever I'm passing it off to right now. Who am I passing it off to? Well, speak now or forever hold your peace. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> okay. I'm passing it off to no one. I mean, if it's up to me, I, I mean, let's bounce. I'm done. Y'all done? Yes. We'll yeah. just give a few more minutes for um, the survey. If everybody could do that before um, we jump off, that would be great. Thank you so much, Joseph, um, for today. And we look forward definitely for the next one to be interactive and we will work on that. <laughs> Rebecca, do you have a reminder that the next training is on January 11th? which is one day after your quarterly report will be due. So you should be really ready to be interactive in the session. All right. Well, you guys have an amazing night and a uh, happy holidays to everyone. Thank you so much, Joseph. All right. Thanks, everyone. If you have any troubles with the survey, just go ahead and let me know now. If not, I think we can let everyone go. Thank you so much, Thank you. everybody. Happy holidays, everyone. See you next year. Bye. Bye.